pretensions to introduce people to Mussorgsky, like Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Frank's attitude was very, very different. And these embedded quotations aren't really the point. I'm interested in how Frank makes you think about classical music rather than showing that Frank was influenced by classical music. For me, he throws it back on you. He says, why do you like these sounds? What's exciting about them? Why are these sounds um, suppressed in most areas of musical culture? He's asking questions that you then go back to and say, well, why have I got all this dull music in my collection? He makes you critical. But it's not a matter of spot the classical quote, aren't you clever? He's working at something more interesting and beyond that. It's something about the actual effect of the music on you. Although this influence was often present in whatever musical projects he was working on, by the end of his career, Zappa became far more active in the classical field and was in part embraced by the community itself. In 1981, he was named Master of Ceremonies at the Edgard Varez Tribute Concert. And during this decade, he embarked on a number of musical experiments utilizing the synclavier, producing albums such as Francesco Zappa, his own unique rendition of works by the 18th century composer of the same name. And simultaneously, his own compositions were being played in a classical setting by various orchestras and ensembles. Well, towards the end of his career, um, he'd actually given up stage performances. And I think that when he, when he sort of gave up live recitals, he sort of felt that he could then indulge himself in, you know, the sort of music that he really wanted to do. And he certainly reinvented himself as a, as a modern classical composer, certainly on a par with people like Varese and Stravinsky and his other boyhood idols. <laughs> Although, you know, it must have been very gratifying, I think his principal motivation was that he wanted to hear it. He, he didn't really mind if other people didn't. Towards the end of his life, he recorded an entire album of Edgar Varez pieces called The Rage and the Fury. It's never been released. And apparently, um, according to a close relation of his, um, it was enough that Frank could hear it. There were some people in the classical or avant-garde musical world who saw Zappa as a serious composer, who realised that the apparent uh, rock or pop surface of much of his music actually um, concealed something much more serious in intent that was going on below the surface. Those kind of people were the ones who would have encouraged uh, him in his work uh, with Varese and in Webern in later life. Um, they would have included, as well, Pierre Boulez, who famously conducted some of Zappa's works on disc, and so on and so forth. In fairness, those people were in a minority. To this day, the vast majority of those involved in classical music, particularly those who are more attached to the past than to the present, would see Zappa very much as, as a joke. Uh, someone from the, the rock world who's somehow trying to... Um, get some kind of kudos through reference to the avant-garde classical world. As a consequence, Zappa is not taken seriously. But deep down, I suspect that he wished to be taken very seriously as a real composer, rather than as a rock musician who had aspirations, shall we say. I think by the time that the uh, Ensemble Modern played the Yellow Shark music, I think that was, he was gratified by that whole thing. That uh, made him look like a composer that, you know, that he always wanted to be. He had no interest in being a member of the classical community, and he was 
in the rock world and he felt that that was the foundation that's what he liked musically energetically and he really did like playing on stage he liked to an audience and he did really feel that i'm quite sure i wouldn't be saying this wrongly that that he wanted to communicate to audiences kids in particular young people in particular and uh and this was clearly a way to do it whereas if you're a member of the classical music community you might well ask who are you communicating with you know you're writing these great pieces but who's hearing them Frank was just Frank, and he was doing just fine, just doing what he was doing. And why should he be doing something else? You know, he wrote the, he wrote the classical pieces, but they were always sort of integrated in all kinds of ways, rhythmically, especially because he because he liked odd rhythms, but he liked energetic rhythms. So that, you know, as you well know, a lot of the pieces are made up of sevens and fives and elevens and whatever, whatever. And uh, but all part being played very energetically, not being played as a tricky rhythm, which you can now point to and say, well, I mathematically figured out that there should be 11 beats there, and then we contrast and so on and so on. So so it was all rock and roll, really. That's that's what it was down to. Even the classical pieces. Mm -hmm. As with the entire culture of rock and roll, the bedrock of Zappa's approach to popular music was rhythm and blues. Just as the freak-out list of influences mentioned obscure composers unknown to many of its audience, it also included both popular and less familiar names from the world of R&B, whose work was inspirational for the young Zappa. And although by the time he was making his first steps into the popular music industry, many of these artists were being celebrated by the bands of the British invasion, back in the 1950s, even those figures who went on to the greatest success were a marginalized element of American popular culture. What you have to remember is that in the sort of late 40s, early 50s, um, that R&B was kind of an illicit pleasure for white teenagers. You'd sort of pick things up through the static on the radio, some sort of black station that would be playing items like um, Too Many Drivers by Smiley Lewis or Work With Me Annie by Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. They were all about sex and nearly all of them were banned from white radio or at least, you know, received very restricted airplay. So, you know, you felt that you were sort of homing in on something that was a little bit sort of underground. <laughs> As a result of this, you know, Frank, his scholarly nature actually impelled him to sort of explore beneath that. And he actually found some quite obscure artists. And as a teenager, Zappa shared this passion for blues and R&B with his school friend, Don Van Vliet, who would become Captain Beefheart. Through their very early compositions, they played with blues forms. And as Zappa developed as a musician, he performed in bands that pushed the respectable boundaries of race and music in suburban America. Lancaster, where they grew up, I mean, its distance from Los Angeles was measurable in much as years as miles. It was very remote in the desert regions. There was a lot of opposition, particularly when Frank had the Soots, I think it was, or one of the other groups. It was actually at, was racially integrated, and so the local authorities thoroughly objected to that. So, I mean, you know, it, it was an uphill battle all the way. And despite his interest in classical composition and his work scoring films in the early 1960s, Zappa always kept his hand in the R&B world. A member of various groups before his discovery of the Soul Giants, the covers band who would become the Mothers of Invention. 